I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dan Lopez, the Chief Business Officer at Arcasis, a new space commercial startup building the world's first space outpost for assembly, integration, and resupply. Dan leads finance, strategy, corporate development, operations, and partnerships at Arcasis. In previous roles, he has experience as a technical co-founder and board member of several new space startups and nonprofits, providing strategy for game-changing space data and machine learning applications and products at some of the world's most influential organizations, including the DOD, UN, NASA, USA, NGA, ESA, SETI, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Bank. So Dan holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Integrated Science and Technology, Biotechnology, from James Madison University. And he joins us today to discuss Arcasis' ambitious plans in the rapidly emerging commercial space market. So Dan, welcome, sir. I am so happy to have you. Thanks, Tom. So, well, very pleasure to be here. Very glad to be here. Let me start out by asking, where are you guys in the construction and design process here on Earth for mm -hmm. the ports? And, and when is the first one anticipated to launch? That's a great, great question. We've had um, a, a really good, exciting uh, first uh, couple of years here, um, going from a couple napkin drawings to something that we think is uh, very, very compelling to shift uh, the entire space economy forward into... Um, uh, the likes of something that was seen back in the, the early to mid 90s, the shift of consumption of the internet turned to the World Wide Web uh, for the consumer, not just for academics, but for the consumer accessing the internet became uh, a mundane thing. Um, and we are uh, at an inflection point right now with uh, the space industry. We'll come back to that. We, we, we are right now a couple years into developing out the architecture and uh, the atomic units of our uh, larger uh, initiatives and vision. So we have concocted um, a couple crazy ideas and one of them being um, a propulsive uh, ESPA ring based uh, vessel that has six sides. Um, it's a hexagonal shape, um, but each side can uh, come and go um, and build upon itself. So it can self-aggregate as well. And on the outside of the port, we have uh, up to 60 uh, odd interfaces for you know, things like robotics or additional um, payloads that can be hosted there to assembling new payloads and or satellites that can even be launched from the port. Um, we also took a, a step back to reflect on what is really the, the going rate for what we we're trying to do. Humans are awesome. We're, we're really uh, fond of humans, but not very good at being in space. Um, and so what we wanted to do is create architecture that is uh, agnostic of humans and something that can grow to uh, a football field size uh, structure or many of them very quickly. Um, and so we've created the atomic unit called the port module. And if you think of it in terms of um, a you know, biological cell where things can go in and out of a cell, the cell can subdivide and, and specialize in other types of things, or it can be part of something much, much larger, like a uh, you know, living, breathing, walking um, bio, microbiome, right? And uh, we are looking to do um, something in space even as soon as the year uh, turns next year. Um, and we're going to be putting up a, a specific type of uh, technology that we think is the, the basic element to get it all started. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that. But so we're expecting a, a flight opportunity uh, next, next year, early next year. And then uh, in thereafter, we're going to be looking at building a wedge, uh, the wedge being the trapezoidal shape of one side of our port module. Ah, okay. Now, so before I go further, I have a video from the website that I want to play. 
And, and, and so let me put this up. This is a two minute video that, that kind of walks people through and helps them visualize what exactly the ports are. So Dan, do you think you could kind of walk me through this in, in terms of what we're seeing and, and what it means, I guess? Yeah, sure. What you're seeing right now is a robotic arm attached to one of our uh, interfaces. Uh, if you want to pause it right there, that's a great, uh, uh, there's a, yeah, that's a, if you go back right there and pause it. So what we're looking at here is a couple things that are going up. Now, you can see the outside of the, uh, the port module um, yeah, that has a bunch of different interfaces. And right here, you see a remote sensing camera attached to something that um, looks like a small little CubeSat even. And that CubeSat is one of our partners' technologies that uh, bolts right on the outside of our uh, our port module and can actually build in itself more sub components. So that can be utilized for um, uh, things for compute to uh, power to translate uh, uh, mechanical um, uh, pointing, like it could be a pointing platform for a remote sensor camera, or it can be released from the uh, port module as a free flyer. Ah, okay. So, so if I could interject, just to help the audience understand, um, the port itself is the large six-sided vehicle that would be at the top of this image, and it's got it looks like what's like a giant circle inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And well, inside it, that is what we call a, an ESPA ring. The ESPA ring, if, you, if you've ever seen a, a SpaceX uh, launch where they shoot out a bunch of things from uh, what they call a secondary payload, um, where uh, they launch out uh, things like uh, Starlink to CubeSats to whatever it might be. Um, that ESPA ring is the thing that holds that all together. And what we're doing is basing our architecture on something that's well known. A lot of the rocket launch providers know how to deal with it. Uh, it's well known how to manufacture it. And it's structurally um, just right at the um, perfect uh, sizing for us to be put into a fairing. But we can also stack many of our port modules uh, later down the road and ship up many of these, not just um, one module, but you know, it would be. Um, uh, if you're going to build an international space station, you don't just send up uh, one uh, module. No one's going to use that. So you're going to have to have something that builds upon itself. And yeah. This is uh, how we do it. So let, let me let me hit play again there. We can see this. Now, the robotic arm here is something that we think is really uh, fantastic. The the science fiction that gets converted here to reality is that the robotic arm is a modular uh, a robotic arm that can attach to one uh, interface and let go and do its thing. It can manipulate or uh, you can see here in a docking mechanism, or it can release from one uh, side and attach to another and then release. And so it's actually crawling on a, uh, a port module. Now, what, why is that important is that different jobs for the same robotic arm uh, will come to play as the thing grows and it has to go to different locations to be able to do those jobs. So not only can it be um, something that's a, a, a fundamental requirement to be highly dexterous, but it also has to be something that's mobile and go somewhere else to be able to be utilized at its full functioning capability uh, anywhere on the board. Yeah. Now, now, so one of the things that I've noticed here, and we're seeing cut frames, but it looks like you mentioned the modularity of this. We're almost at the end of the video. So what, what I'll probably do is come back to this in just a moment. Sure. Um, but it looks like you mentioned these things are, are basically stackable, almost like uh, Lego blocks. And, and so you can combine them from one unit into a larger unit and those larger units can do you know independent things so that that is the end of our video so let me let me do this i'm going to pause that and see if i can come back so here we have here we have oops here we have a device it looks like there's one large port module and then there are let me see uh, one, two, three, four, five, six of them stacked around it. Now that's that's interesting because a few minutes ago, uh, it looked like there was one. Let me see if I can find that. 
with three. So, so what you were talking about is the modularity. So when you say atomic unit, what you're saying is this hexagonal six-sided device, this is one of these, and you can see the, the again, the, the hollow area in the center there. Uh, you can combine those into groups of three, uh, groups of six, and potentially you could just continue to add them, right? As large as you might need. Absolutely. One of the things that uh, the subatomic unit is the wedge or what we call a cutter class vessel. And all of our naming conventions at um, Arcasis are nautical in, ah. in nomenclature. And when we say um, the port, and, and, and the analogy for port, right? We all understand what a port is on Earth, where you, you can have onboarding or offloading of uh, commodities. You can service a vessel. You can refuel it. You can create a new vessel there. Um, you have telecommunications, all that kind of stuff. But if you think about a port, the port, you would not just have one port, right? So, And they each have their own functionality. So if we have three or four here. Yeah, what well, well, is the wedge, right? It, the wedge and it, and if I could if I could jump in real quick, the reason <clears> I fast forwarded it here, and I'm kind of going to go back and forward a little bit in the video. Hopefully, I'm doing this okay. So the wedges, that's that's what these are, right? They're out mm -hmm. in front of the ports. Mm -hmm. that's okay, right. okay, that's perfect. Right. So um, when we have all of our engineers and uh, PhDs on our team uh, working, we we don't have them really doing rocket science anymore. We have them building toys. Um, and one of the things that we built is this little model. Um, it's 120 at the size um, of our port module. Oh, there you go. And it's just to illustrate um, each one of these things docks with it itself. Um, oh, and... okay. So the wedge, I see. So six of those wedges combine into one port module. That is right. That is right. And inside is propulsion and... Um, essentially reaction wheels and other things to create the uh, ability to move around and uh, do a dance with things coming to, to the port. Yeah. Now, I can I tell you, one of the things that makes me really excited about this idea is, and, and I'm, I'm sure that this was a major consideration, is the payloads and rockets are very limited, right? Not just in terms of weight, but also in terms of size. And so by being able to put things up modularly like that what you're doing is you're saying from the get-go you're saying okay we can put this up in pieces and it can grow and scale over time and that's really exciting I, I mean we, we've seen that right i mean the, the international space station is an example of that but it seems like their approach is much more rudimentary right it's we're going to put up a module and hopefully we'll add on to it in the future you know and then several years later they add something else on and what you're doing is from the get-go, you're saying, we're going to put something up there that is extensible and designed to be increased in size, increased in complexity over time. That's right. Um, the, the analogy, too, is like, like you, Tim, would not drive a semi-truck to go to the store, right? That, that's just not realistic. You wouldn't um, go uh, hop on your cobalt-powered mainframe computer at home. That, that's just not that's not how uh, consumption patterns would enable innovation and scalability and Moore's law has taken effect right and, and shrinking of things has enabled quite um, a shift of our quality of life on earth um, what I think is better suited to kind of create the analogy and again we're we're not creating um, the exact same thing but an analogy that people understand is that um, a kid today can go on for five bucks on a cloud provider, say Amazon or, or Google, um, and they can test the, out their idea. They can send it to their friends or their potential customers, and then they start spending 50 bucks a month. And then they start spending $1,500 a month because they're testing and validating their idea. But then they're not going to go just destroy their architecture. They're going to continually iterate. And that kid now has built Snapchat or TikTok. And if you think about 20 years ago, when we first started seeing social networking, like no one would think of a consumption pattern like TikTok. But that has been a driving force on why cloud computing and its modularity is 
critical for innovation. So we are building very similar constructs, but just in space. So that full blown industries can take what they're doing on earth and transpose it into space, right? And so that innovation can happen without having to deal with the actual rocket science. We have to track that up. Yeah, yeah, that, no, that is wonderful, as well as the cost, right? Because by putting up a small port, now, so one of the things I wanted to ask about was, can people do, or sorry, could, could corporations do manufacturing in space? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can do science and things like that, and lots of robotic, because I, I'm assuming this is probably going to be mostly or all robotic. Um, but the idea that I have is, it seems like a corporation, if they were going to manufacture something in a port, they could put up one of these modules, right? And, and there's, a, there's a cost associated with that. They could test it out. They could, you know, vet their problems, make the whole thing work. As they grow their industry for whatever they're manufacturing, they could add more and extend that. That's, that's kind of the... 130%. You know, like I think as we get into uh, uh, manufacturing, let, let's take uh, two or three really phenomenal examples of where space exploration and, and the ISS has really opened up our eyes. Really, we haven't executed on those things. Um, the, the International Space Station, by the way, is a, a national lab here in the States. But as we share resources around the world, it becomes just as humans go there, um, it becomes not easier, but harder to do the things that you're talking about. So we need something that allows us to do things that you can't do on the ISS, like certain biologics or certain uh, virology, right? You just don't want to expose um, uh, humans to certain types of dangers there. Um, it, I am one of uh, a, a team that tried to do um, uh, remote sensing in a certain way with uh, radio frequency and microwave uh, from the ISS to test it out. But we ended up looking at how it would irradiate the brains of people <laughs> who are sleeping there. So we couldn't do it. Um, the list goes on and on and on. So you can't move things around. You can't look at certain uh, directions on the ISS. You can't um, heat things up a certain way. But what's really awesome about the port, you can do all of that because there's no humans and you can do things that are within your risk tolerance, not a risk tolerance that is nationally subsidized um, human explore, exploration. But what we do for things like manufacturing, you could go clean up all the junk and then shove it into a, a recycling um, uh, mechanism on, on a port and create not only um, the raw materials, but that can also, those raw materials can be feedstock for propulsion, which is awesome. Mm. The other thing is uh, things like uh, growing food. Why not? Why, why would you have to grow something inside the ISS? You could it, make it big inflatable when you get to somewhere, say Mars or, or the moon, and you can actually create larger amounts of, uh, of, uh, uh, produce and production from from growables near where you need to go and not at the time of launch and so that's really important to think about that so you know water or uh, other types of metallic feedstock for propulsion so if you think about those fundamental things those are where we can take them with us away but what about on earth fiber optic is uh, fiber optics is one um, manufacturing facility that is way better suited for space for purity of the, the uh, fiber optics. So you could bring all that stuff back for really extraordinary um, uptick in performance for um, fiber optics, but you got to get it back. So how do you get it back? And so we, we have to think about not only getting to space, but returning from space without humans. Um, so that's, we're also interacting with humans, right? Um, and that's really a, a fascinating next step of uh, industrializing space. Well, and so I wanted to ask, and I think you touched on this earlier. So it sounds like this is compatible with a lot of existing rocket designs, right? So you could, in, in theory, you could reach this using, I, I, like I think SpaceX is probably you know one, one of the big ones. If you had SpaceX rockets, you could take those up and 
presumably that could all be unmanned. And then after you offload or transfer cargo or whatever you need to do in a robotic way, you could return to Earth with that, right? We could, or we could go somewhere else, right? And build additional functionality at a port that already exists. Um, so again, our architecture is not for a satellite constellation that over time you have to refresh it and it burns up. Uh, none, none of that. Ours is really built so that when you send some resource to space, it's conserved in a way that can be reused and repurposed with the, the same atomic and subatomic units. Now, could this be used as the basis for future space stations? Could you build things that were manned with this? Absolutely. Um, there's no reason, uh, Bigelow or any other type of uh, uh, inflatable, all the way to creating structures that are powered by uh, port modules and have robotics on, have escape modules on all of these other types of facilities that we have um, at, at any given time at, at, at port. The other thing too is communications, right? Uh, the communications is uh, one element that's critical to exploration as, as well as like routine cadence with getting somewhere in space. But when you have something that, that can um, have different types of uh, communications that can mature over time and iterate, now someone who operates a communications company, I'm not going to name any specifics, but those companies may not compete with a KSAT, right? The KSAT and others have kind of like a uh, unspoken uh, dominance in space communication, but that doesn't have to reside in always going to be like that, right? That it, we, we can look at companies that are much larger in terms of market cap and translating a fractional part of their business to investing in communication for way more scalable products and offerings, um, especially for industrializing uh, these areas of space. Yeah. Now, in terms of the port itself, what kind of cost? I, I mean, I, I'm guessing it seems like there's probably a cost savings, especially with the initial modules. What what kind of costs are companies looking at? What kind of savings do you think they can anticipate compared to traditional space access? Yeah, it's, it's orders of magnitude. Um, but when we when we talk about um, our first wedge, our first wedge has a, a little bit of you know kind of proving ground, right? Like they have to get our own um, operations, ground segment, ground station network all built up. Some of that's baked into um, our early days, right? Just like any company. But um, so when you launch up a, a wedge, that, that's going to be somewhere in the, the uh, realm of $10 million with a, with a launch. Um, but it deprecates. As you have more functionality going up to space as well, the little wedge can form other things. And so that those other things create more services and that can buy down the cost generally for uh, non-module operation. Now, when we uh, look at the module, that's, that's around $38 million. But if you think about the cost of a billion dollars uh, module, it's then why don't we just send five of them up? And now you have something that can go other places. It's not just stuck in some other uh, Leo orbit, it can actually go into other places and then disaggregate. So mm -hmm. let's say you want to go to cis lunar and you have two modules that need to go different directions for whatever reason, or create additional um, economic power projection for providing services in cis lunar or in lunar orbit. That's the key. So large companies would start create infrastructure that other people start to ride on top of. And you can see what happened in 1995, the companies that uh, came across the wire after 2000, some of those companies didn't last. Like the Net, the, the Netscapes, the AOLs, the, the, they, they created extraordinary wealth and uh, shift in, in uh, consumption patterns. But when you think about who, who are dominating the markets now, they're going to start to be looking at what other markets they can dominate. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you guys have already built and demonstrated a fully functional wedge. And again, that's that's the subatomic unit, as that's you've perfect. described it, um, with real payloads, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that one is in place. 
Um, and then there's also, uh, you guys have a lot of support as well. I, from what I understand, I'm sorry, I'm just reading my notes here. There's already a $17.7 million contract from the, the DOD's Defense Innovation Unit. I think yeah, that's yeah. really exciting. And you, you have letters of support from the New Zealand Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment, and they they oversee the New Zealand Space Agency. So how how is New Zealand connected with this? New Zealand um, is positioned very nicely in the uh, Oceania realm um, because of its status as the most favored nation, as well as the part of the Five Eyes. They they have the ability to innovate with less uh heritage if you will okay. um, and incumbents and so ramping up new technologies and test beds national test beds for economic and scientific development new zealand be became just an amazing partner and one of our our, our corporate partners um, is actually based in new zealand and they're looking at swarm technologies and other Things for uh, RPO, Rendezvous and Proximity Operations. Um, and to do that at scale, we are, are looking at um, different types of technology to um, play in concert. So not only would they be a customer of ours, we would be a customer of theirs over time. And the port module is, in essence, a symbiotic um, test bed all the way to commercialization and deployment of that tech into a commercial environment. And New Zealand, uh, we are now, we are an official company in New Zealand as well. Um, and that's primarily to uh, create the instantiation of um, innovation that is in, based in Oceania as well. So kind of be a center of excellence for Australia to all the other uh, nations that would participate. Ah, okay, okay. And, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Defense Innovation Unit, and actually I, I've done interviews with them in the past, mm -hmm. they are really big on finding emerging technologies. Um, they vet them well, and they like stuff that's out of the box, right? So you guys check all the boxes there. Um, and so that's it's exciting to see support from them as well. That's right. The General Bhutan and the entire team of the Space Portfolio have been extraordinarily supportive over the years. Um, not only for what we're trying to do, but the um, the architecture to have it really unlock very quickly um, because there are prime eyes. We, we are trying to create something um, that is no longer um, uh, protected uh, on high. So we have to really go quick. And they've been very, very supportive of how to do that. Um, if you look at companies that are stationed in New Zealand, but are American based, they have DARPA and DIU and other types of investors over time. Uh, Rocket Labs and others are perfect partners for us as well. So um, we've right-sized our our payloads um, so that in our vessel so that we can get up with any rocket uh, provider that has a certain class. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dan, this is truly, truly exciting. It, it, this is, I, I, I love this idea. I love this entire concept. Let me close today by asking what the next steps are and where are things going from here? Yeah, so as you mentioned, um, we did a, a couple demos um, around the world that we connected everyone into a digital twin that we built of the port module. Um, and what our next step is to do is the the, the little... Uh, it's called an applique. It's kind of like a system on a chip design where um, if you would imagine uh, plugging in a USB device, whether it's a camera, music keyboard, whatever it might be, that little thing that could opened up an entire universe, not just like one ecosystem, but many ecosystems of uh, different ways to conduct business with compute and storage and whatever it might be. We've created that thing for space and we're, we're going to be releasing that more um, more so, so that's going to go to space. That's the thing that's going to get space hardened very quickly. Um, and we are going to be also opening up more availability of our digital twin itself for payload developers or, or people who want to build ideas based on um, robotics and commercialization of the, the industrial side, the less human side, but the, the more um, we think about it, that um, becomes our imperative. So that's coming up quick. That's uh, We're going to be releasing some technology there. And if you want to explore it, we have an AR application that you can 
launch the app. You can walk around the port and see how big it is and really put it in perspective in your, your office or, or your living room at home and play around with it. Um, and that is on our uh, website and I'll have more information uh, on that to come. Yeah, and I'll put links up to that as well. So Dan, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time today. No, thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me.